Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is the final plenary session of the 25th Common Core meeting devoted to tort law. And uh, let me start right away with um, this session with a um, few remarks that are simply meant to tie the uh, today's session with what we heard uh, today in the first plenary to relaunch or revise critically some of the tort law issues touched upon yesterday. I don't want to encroach upon the time that other speakers, especially our young colleagues, need, so contrary to what, uh, what is Ugo, contrary to what Ugo does, I won't speak for half an hour. Tort law, first remark. Tort law works on pre-existing prerogatives, mainly established by contract and property law regimes. Tort law can make these prerogatives steadier, can refine them, or can overturn them. Tort law may indeed play a subversive role in the law as we learn it at school, especially in the civilian jurisdictions and in the mainstream uh, literature. This is why tort law should be considered as a critical game changer in the orthodox taxonomies we usually rely on. True, contrary to other fields of private law, extended attention for tort law is a relatively recent uh, uh, scholarly attitude. It dates back to no more than five generations in the Western Hemisphere, and even less in Europe. It was, the, as, it, as it was well known, it was the statistic growth of lawsuits and decided cases during the second Industrial Revolution that pushed Western jurists to muse deeply and largely upon the technicalities, the role, and the aims of tort law. Yet, in the recent decades, we have witnessed an increasing recourse to tort law rules to settle or prevent disputes traditionally allocated to other controlling legal devices. And this is what happened uh, outside and inside Europe. The reference goes not only to the demise of contract rules in the medical malpractice sector or to the tortification of the nuisance, uh, law uh, in the common law jurisdictions, but also to the massive penetration of clauses aiming to harness or shun tort liability in the international business contracts, to the recourse to tort law te technicalities to adjudicate the disputes arising out of investment contracts in the ICSID framework, to the use of the European Court of Human Rights makes of tort law remedies to protect property, personality rights, and fundamental freedoms. This is an issue on which um, Radica dwelled yesterday from the U.S. Uh, side. This was the first. The second remark. From both a synchronic and a diachronic perspective, one may easily find out that tort law is bent to serve a plurality of uh, um, aims and play a plurality of roles which can be differently prioritized according to times, places, and ideologies, prevailing, prevailing ideologies. In the second half of the 19th century, Western industrialization and the parallel connected increase of the accidents are out there. At that time, the thin flow of injuries occasionally caused by animals, servants, craftsmen, and farmers had already become a stream which had been carrying with it the hardship of the interaction between men, women, and machines. This is why, this is why as the mainstream narrative goes by, while in the common law system, fault liability surfaces through the maze of the causes of action, on the European continent, the traditional fault principle, imbued as it was with moral and subjective connotations, starts with being declined, as the departure from the objective standard of care, the objective standard of care the society expects to be met by any fellow under the given circumstances. Thus, on the one hand, the principle no liability without fault comes to mean no liability without objective fault. On the other hand, the duty requirement and the standard of objective fault are called upon to mediate between the need of physical safety 
and those of productive activities, but putting tort law infrastructure at the service of the laissez-faire economy postulates. On principle, therefore, the loss should lie where it falls, and the physical, physical stress, physical injury may be compensated if and only if it is caused by the breach of a duty and or by an objective, objectively negligent behavior. The assessment of all this, of course, is left in the hands of the judicial coteries of the time. So far, the mainstream narrative, as it resonated yesterday in this room as well. A few remarks are in order, though. First, Looking at the historical development of tort law as if its main use and aim were to assist capital accumulation and meet the needs of, ra of the rising bourgeoisie at the detriment of victims of industrialization is quite a reductive standpoint. Outside the rather screen of this standpoint, one finds first disputes where the parties were not bringing to the fore individual safety versus business interests. Further, one cannot disregard that in many areas where fault liability surfaced in common law, it replaced a no liability rule and not a strict liability one. Nor can one disregard that continental Europe, especially during the last three decades of the 19th century, saw the rise of the voice, not only of the unions, with their claims for less unjust working um, conditions, but also of the socialist ideas contrasting against the pillars of the bourgeois individualism. This phenomena drew the attention of scholars and judges and trickled down in the academic literature and judicial rulings where one can even find surfa surfacing the idea that the entrepreneurs are the cheapest cost avoiders, and in principle, therefore, they should be strictly liable for the harms caused by their activity. That was at that time that this idea came to the fore. In the same decades, all over Europe, special statutes were enacted, establishing strict liability for a variety of business activities and imposing upon entrepreneurs uh, compulsory participation in social insurance mechanisms designed in particular to give solution to the mounting problem of workplace accidents. Moreover, there's no doubt that in the 20th century, the call for implementing a laissez-faire ideology, also in the tort law realm, thereby shrinking as much as possible the scope of liability, this laissez-faire laissez -faire ideology has never gone away. Yet, while in the common law jurisdiction we have been witnessing an incremental uh, expansion of the scope of tort and negligence in continental Europe, a gradual differentiation in the social extraction of legal actors, differentiation in the social extraction of legal actors has fostered the legal actors' uh, increasing responsiveness to the need of enlarging, enlarging the range of interests worth protecting through tort liability rules and the need of widening the scope of strict liability rules and of legal devices intended to shift the cost of the injury upon whom is better equipped to bear it. So the second remark was meant to underline that not everything is black or white, not even in tort law history. And this leads me to the, my third remark. Understanding the overall context and its dynamics is simply necessary for any accurate analysis of any field of the law, including tort law. Take the debate on the aims and the functions of tort law. This debate still relies on all-encompassing catchphrases, such as compensation, deterrence, punishment. But how can we assess the actual value and persuasiveness of these views. We would need, we should need, factual analysis perusing the conformity of the law in action to the theoretical postulates. Yet, what any of the above perspectives, uh, compensation, deterrence, punish, punishment, what 
Any of these perspectives, if missing, is precisely a close and strong connection to the ground data shaping the day-by-day -day tort law functioning. In order to understand how the various aims of tort law are pursued in practice, many questions should be asked and answered. What is the ratio of tort law trials to the number of accidents? What is the ratio of, of damages to the GDP, to the public expenditure for the justice system, to the number of lawyers? How does the cost of access to justice filter the number and nature of lawsuits? How many plaintiffs and defendants are not citizens, not Caucasian? How many plaintiffs and defendants are women, older people, physically or psychically disabled persons? How many plaintiffs or, and defendants are business entities or professionals, blue collars, white collars? Who are the successful plaintiffs and the successful defendants? What is the average income of plaintiffs and of defendants? One should, could, add, could add what the average income of lawyers as well. What is the ratio of coverage of social insurance and of, and of first and third party liability insurance across the cohorts of plaintiffs and defendants? What are the tort law claims that are successful? How many awards of damages are there? What is their size and for what kind of harm? Or take product liability within and outside the realm of the directive, European directive and collateral regulation. What, if any, is the difference in prices of goods and services before and after liability has been established against product manufacturers or and service providers. And the list, as you easily uh, understand, could go on and on. The point is that in most, if not all countries, those data are simply missing. Or scattered across microfields with no connection with the overall picture. The foregoing is not all. And here it comes my fourth and final remark. Mainstream analyses are usually, in the tort law field as well, are usually oblivious also of another crucial phenomenon. That's, say, the pre- and extra-judicial dynamics of tort law. Pre- and extra. I won't dwell on it uh, long, also because Marta Infantino and I have written extensively on this subject. Let me just submit to your attention two remarks, closely connected one to the other, and uh, going in a direction different from what I understood to be some of yesterday's speakers' views. The first remark is that the core of algorithmic law is represented by a bundle of unofficial rules, not written by lawyers, but de developed over time by the different communities contributing to the technological development. And these are unofficial rules, not posited by any state or by any public authority, that control and rule the technological development without any uh, relevance, any bearing of lawyers in the, on this process. The second remark is that we lawyers, we citizens, cannot content ourselves with the fact that algorithm X has decided that the school or the hospital have to be built there rather than there. Or that any investment money amounts to one or two simply because the fintech algorithm has decided so. We need to be informed. We, need, we do need to be informed in plain language about what elements have been factored in the algorithm and why, and by whom, following the instructions given by whom, appointed by whom, and finally, whoever acted negligently and caused damage had to be, has to be held accountable. That's it, basically, and uh, as, you, as you see, uh, these remarks were simply meant to, to connect, as I said, the, 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 the plenary session, yesterday plenary session with today one, and to drive the 
to remind ourselves that the debate also, as far as tort law is concerned, has to move in a direction close to the overall context and the respectful of the variety of issues that shape the role of tort law outside and inside European societies. So, thank you for uh, your attention. And uh, now the uh, floor is to Matthias, right? Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm going to start on a totally unrelated note. Um, this is just a little anecdote which I should have added yesterday to Luisa Antonioli's talk on Olelando, um, yeah, but there was no time in the discussion. But Luisa insisted that it's, it's too good to be a myth, um, and, and you may find this amusing. About 15 years ago, I was teaching in a summer program for the Tulane Law School on the idyllic Greek island of Spetses, and Olelando was also part of the program. So we spent about three weeks together having a lot of breakfast together, and and, and becoming uh, pretty good friends. And Ole always showed up with <clears throat> a large entourage of relatives, which we called the Vikings. The Vikings come to breakfast and you know, everything was taken. But the fun part was when it became t time to depart, we needed to take these little water taxis from the hotel shore to the main pier to go back to, uh, to Piraeus. And Ole Lando uh, took charge of that and had organized it. And since he's such a large, a large clan, <clears throat> he had ordered, ordered two of these water taxis, and there was room for myself and my then wife. And so he uh, invited us to join him. And when the two taxis arrived, there was a debate, apparent misunderstanding about whether the price that he had negotiated was for the two taxis together <clears throat> or separately. So it was twice as high. So Ole Lando insisted it was for the two taxis together. Now you have to imagine Ole Lando on the one side, speaking English, being from Denmark, and these two local boat taxi drivers <coughs> who spoke barely any English and Greek. And Ole Lando started a heated debate with them. And finally, he invoked principles of European contract law. <laughs> <laughs> His poor people had no idea what this guy was talking about. But they finally gave up and they say, whatever this madman is about, you get into the taxi, pay half the price, and we'll take you to the pier. It was a great success for the European principles of Twitter. <laughs> <coughs> It's, it's very nice to be back in, in Trento where all this business with the Common Core started in 1994-1995. Franz and I are representatives of the first generation, of the founding generation. And it's not easy to look back without some nostalgia, um, which is also connected to the locale, to Trento and so forth. Um, and to, um, one, one remembers how different the situation then was and in which we found ourselves. Uh, Rudolf Schlesinger was still alive, um, but perhaps more importantly, the European Union was a very different animal from what it is today. It was much smaller. Um, it had 11 member states, and in 1995, three were added, making it 14, which was half the size of today. This was before it was opened up to the east. So there was much greater homogeneity and much smaller numbers, much more manageable. And in the subsequent years, when the east joined, you know, we realized we had a management problem because all of a sudden, things became hugely more complicated. Um, and if you go from 14 to 28 countries eventually, it's not like your complexity doubles, you know, it quadruples, uh, it grows incrementally. And um, we, have, we had lots of interesting challenges connected to that. Turkey was still a credible uh, candidate for the EU, which was long, long gone. Um, we had discussions about whether Switzerland should be included because it was not in the EU. So France's candidacy was always a little shaky. Um, we had discussions whether anybody from the United States, I'm German trained, but live in the United States, should be included, like Jim Gordley and I. We had major discussions about civil law, common law, which are now sort of moved a little bit into the background, more muted, but that was a major theme. Um, there was a big use commune debate, whether European private law could be built on the tradition of the late medieval, early modern use commune, and there was an ideological battle between the Zimmerman camp and the Dilcher and Carboni camp and so forth. Um, so there were lots of fundamental ideological battles. The enthusiasm for unifying European law was unbridled. It was almost unbroken. And from today's perspective, it looks positively naive. Um, everybody was convinced that a European civil code was a very serious option and might be coming a couple of years down the road. Um, when that eventually failed because of a lack of support, or winning support from the Commission and the European Union largely, um, that everybody was at least convinced we're going to have a common contract law. Right? And when, when that failed, everybody was convinced that at least we're going to have an optional instrument. And so it got whittled down and whittled down and eventually in 2009 generated the common frame of reference and that kind of went to the bookshelves. And so it was interesting to see how these grand ideas gradually fell prey to reality, to the harsh realities 
of a politics in the European Union. And at the end of the day, all the legislative projects, um, the von Bayer project particularly, which is a huge network funded by some 5 million euros from Brussels, ultimately came to naught. It's interesting to see that the scholarly projects, like uh, the Trento project, have survived. So we have, a, a, you know, we have some reason to be proud as survivors, in a sense. We're not the only ones. The tort group in Vienna has survived. The, the, the family law principles people in Utrecht have survived. But it's interesting to watch that those who tied their enterprises to the political wind in Brussels all died with that political wind. And those who did not, who pursued an academic uh, goal, like the Common Core, survived the changes of the political wind. And maybe there's a moral in there. You know, as academics, we should be quite careful whether we go to bed with political leadership because whenever they change their mind and the funding dries up, there goes the project. So I'm saying this in part because I am uh, proud and happy that the Common Core has survived for 25 years, which was, you know, if somebody had asked me in 1995 how long is this going to go on, I would have said five, ten, right? Then it's going to fall prey to, I don't know, just lack of interest or something, but it hasn't. And... Um, Louise and I had just a little talk about it and said part of the strength is the anarchical uh, nature of the whole thing, right? It's not a top-down hierarchical project. It's sort of an anarchical thing that keeps growing. And it's also due to Ugo and Mauro from the very beginning involving young people, uh, massively involving young people, who are, many of whom are not so young anymore, but that has been part of, the great, of its great success. Now, when I say the legislative projects have all uh, sort of failed, uh, you should, we should also note that that's not in the nature of the beast, but the legislative process uh, in, in Brussels can succeed. It's interesting to contrast the failure of these legislative projects on a substantive law level with the incredible success, if it is, of legislative projects on the private international law level. We have now Brussels regulations 1 through X, Rome regulations 1 through X. The European Union has rather successfully legislated, codified private international law um, interestingly, without much participation of the scholarly community. The Brussels bureaucrats have pretty much done this on their own. Um, they sometimes listen to academics, but, but more or less on the margin. So the failure of legislative projects is not in the nature of the legislative process in Brussels. It's, it's rather in the nature of the private law enterprise. But let me turn to tort law in particular, for at least for a moment. Tort law has an uneasy position in this whole game because it's not market law in the primary sense in which contract law is, or even property law is. I mean, if you have a common market, it seems obvious that you need a common contract law, although coming from the United States, much less obvious to me than it seems obvious to most of my German colleagues. Um, but it's a prima facie, you know, it makes some sense to say maybe we should have a common contract law because we have so many transboundary transactions. And maybe we should have uh, a common regime of property rights because if properties cross boundaries all the time, there will be lots of transaction costs if that happens and we don't have a unified regime. Tort law is much different. Tort law is not really market law in that sense, right? Tort law is the law that kicks in when something has gone wrong among strangers, mainly, when accidents have happened. And so it's interesting to see that the European uh, unification projects have not much focused on tort law, really. They've had a little bit of a marginal existence. Um, who is interested in a unified tort law? It's not so obvious who that should be, right? Consumers? Not really. Um, and if you see what the European Union has done for consumers in the area of tort law, it's very, very little. Product liability, I come to that in a moment, but that's almost it, right? So the European Union has not been very protective of consumers in the tort law area across the board. Um, who's really interested in a unified tort law? Well, mostly defendants, mostly uh, enterprises who are on the hook for tort liability. That is, of course, insurance companies. Um, they're probably the primary interested party. Um, they already have a European business. They work transboundary, way beyond you know, positive law. Uh, I doubt that they need much of a uniform regime because they pool resources and uh, recovery funds already. Uh, they have a system of reinsurance, which is global. So I think they operate probably largely independently of the regulatory or of the private law fragmentation. Um, and the other one are producers of manufactured goods, those who are su potentially subject to product liability. And for them, uh, uniform rules make some sense. Because if you operate on a uniform market and you are subject to vastly different liabilities, it creates a lot of problems. 
because you have to standardize your products in one way or the other. And so it's no wonder that they lobbied very hard since the 1980s and ultimately successfully for a somewhat uniform regime, which was then enacted in the Product Liability Directive in 1985. But that uniform regime is actually uh, quite weak. Um, it's often trumpeted by the European Commission as a great success, but there are no data to back this up. And uh, so this is a, one element that, that Mauro just made too. It is actually embarrassing how little data we have. Um, for um, updating a chapter that I contributed to a book that Mauro and Tony Sebaugh published, I went just to the latest reports of the Commission on Product Liability Law. And you look for data, and what you find is they say, this has been a great success, and consumers benefit from this, and there are more cases, and you say, okay, where are the footnotes? Where, where are the data? There are none. Uh, it's quite obvious that the European Commission, European institutions, have shown a complete lack of interest in actual data for the last 20, 25 years. There's almost no empirical support for any of these assertions. These are political assertions that are made by some bureaucrats in an offhand way, and they're not backed up by any substantive empirical proof. It's quite an embarrassment for an institution like the European Union, uh, and it makes you wonder you know, how solid their empirical basis for their legislative projects is generally. Now you can say, so who cares? Tort law kicks in when something bad happens, and so it's probably not that important to pay all that much attention to it, but that's not true. Tort law has, of course, a strongly regulatory function, a function looking ahead into the future, a deterrent function, or actually punishing function, as Mauro just alluded to, and that is something we probably haven't paid enough attention to. Um, as European, particularly civil lawyers, we tend to think very strongly about tort law as a system of compensation ex post. And that it is. If, you, if I wear my American hat, and I used to teach tort law in the U.S. and still teach product liability law, um, from a U.S. point of view, that is maybe a secondary function, particularly with the enormous rise of law and economics. The deterrent and regulatory function of tort law has moved much into the foreground. And that is something we don't have, uh, we didn't pay much attention to in Europe so far. And maybe we should pay more attention to that. Um, now we have some uh, interesting and good studies in tort law in the book series. Uh, Monica Hinteregger's book of 2009, I think, on environmental damage, um, personality rights that Aurelia and Gert Bürgemeier put together. They point sort of in the direction of tort law regulating certain aspects that go beyond just plain accidents. Um, that is probably a worthwhile agenda to think about in the future when new tort subjects are considered. So I would combine uh, Mauro's call for a lot more empirical support, a lot more data, uh, of, in which we're very weak, um, with a call for looking more to the regulatory and deterrent function of tort law. And that, of course, means we have to leave our, the comfort zone of our traditional private law a little bit and get more involved with a public law, administrative, regulatory attitude and, and think in that direction. Because that is, if, if anything, probably the future tort law in European uh, unification projects may lie. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Matthias, friends. Thank you, Mauro. I would like to start by thanking Mauro and Hugo for inviting me. I would like also to thank Luisa and Andrea for being our hosts here. And as Matthias said, it's an emotional moment to be back in Trento and to see faces that we've seen a long time ago and to see also places in Trento. My God, uh, it's beautiful. It's, uh, it's, it's fun to be back. Um, a lot of what I thought I would say has been already said. Uh, the question I thought I would want to ask is what is the mission of the Common Core project in the light of the failure of the political project. Uh, the Europeanization, as Matthias just reminded us of, and we said it yesterday, the political Europeanization of private law has failed uh, dramatically. And as he pointed out, while the Common Core project was never normative, never intended to unearth anything in order to give recipes to the political, uh, yet, our raison d'etre ultimately found its limits within the, the notion that somehow Europeans would get their act together and Europeanize their law. So what do we do if that has failed? I mean, the idea of the European Civil Code looked from now 
looks like a total naive illusion. You know, how could we think seriously? I mean, there were books written towards a European civil code. No offense to those of you who are here and who, I mean, we all contributed to these books. We loved the idea from Beruf unserer Zeit. Now we will engage in, you know, unifying law. Why has it failed? And what are the lessons we can learn in order to avoid mistakes in the common core project? It seems to me that, of course, as Luisa said yesterday, there was no awareness. It was this sort of private law mentality. We know, you know, uh, using techniques that nobody understands in order to solve problems. No, ultimately, private law is political, and we totally fail to understand the politics of private law, of choices that happen uh, when you choose one solution over the other. We were apolitical. I'm not talking so much about us, but about the private law uh, clique, uh, the, the, the apparatchik of the private law projects. They were apolitical and, of course, they failed miserably. Um, so, and, and also, I guess we have to reflect on the fact that there was no revolutionary moment. Why would we suddenly adopt a European civil code? It's like the Constitution. It doesn't come just out of the decision to put order in things. That's not how law works. Ultimately, law is created, is the outcome of a political process. And that process, that unification process, was missing. And, uh, I just fell in love, so to speak, with uh, Ulrike Gero, who's a German polit political scientist, who's, who points out that one does not fall in love with the idea of a market. So this notion that, yes, uh, European law had to change in the light of the emergence of a unified, integrated market is something that might appeal. Of course, it's appealing. The Germans did it. The Swiss did it in the 19th century. Once you engage in daily transactions, you wonder why you would have different laws. So you unify. But, you know, it's not something that it seems to me you can just reinvent and impose. So there was no love. There was no emotion. There was just the obsession with the market and the functioning of the market, missing totally on the social dimension of private law. Again, I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to the context in which we were operating. I'm also more skeptical than Matthias about the success of EU law. I mean, if you, it might be true that EPR or conflicts of law rules function. They function in the books. They seem to be adopted. They seem to be then respected and complied with. But if you think of some major cases that the ECJ decided, I want to take two cases that have always made a big impression on me. Brasserie du Pêcheur. Brasserie du Pêcheur tells the German, Germany that it must let go of a distinction between fault and the violation of a duty of care bring us back in the realm of tort. It, the Germans must let go of the idea that you can meaningfully discriminate against pure economic losses. In other words, Brasserie du Pêcheur, with French lenses, Van Gerven is the advocate général, is arguing that the German defenses are no good, that you have to let go of this idea that fault, were, were, you, we may have violated our duty, but we were not at fault. Nobody understands this distinction other than in Switzerland and in Germany. So you would think that after Brasserie du Pêcheur, ah, people will understand and change. Has German law changed in any way whatsoever? Not at all. You go to, you open German books on tort law, and you find 823 with all the distinctions intact as if nothing had happened. That's interesting to see. So the, the notion a la van Gerven that it would be a bottom-up approach and that after all, you know, with all these cases, then we would generate 
a unified law of Torah. No, no, and no. Leitner, another seminal case. This poor woman goes to Turkey, gets sick for three weeks, and asks for the compensation of her ruined vacation. She's been vomiting for three weeks in a row. She said, hey, my vacation is not exactly what I had in mind. Only question to be decided by the ECJ, can one claim the compensation of an extended notion of immaterial loss? Yes, says Leitner, with a beautiful opinion by the Advocate General, showing what the solutions are here and there. Has anything changed? You know, we in Switzerland adopt everything that the EU does, not because we like the EU, but because we want to sell our Swiss army knives, okay? So we want to make sure that the Europeans believe in what we do. So we're Euro-compatible, and we transposed and implemented, autonomously of course, some heavy, you know, directives. You look at the way in which courts have now taken in Leitner, they qualify the cases in which you can maybe get something. In other words, what is going on is that you remain taken, uh, caught in a cultural context that has not moved. I mean, if I want to put it shortly, my deepest belief as I grow older is that Europe is diverse. Europe speaks 24 languages, and you cannot unify the law just like that by having good ideas and imposing them on people. It won't work. And there is, just as I mentioned the languages, there is this essential component of legal culture, which is the language in which you speak it. I mean, let alone the fact that law is culture, and that actually may be a la Minsky, culture is law, if we look at what is going on, in effect, our laws are governed by the way we speak, by the way we think. And to speak a law in English is most bizarre if you're an Italian or a Swiss or uh, what have you. You know, what are we doing thinking that we could speak English? I mean, Listen to me. I've been trying for 35 years to speak English. I don't. I really don't. I kind of vaguely do approach some sort of, you know, command of the language. But in effect, the more serious point is that the way the language I speak will determine the way I conceptualize the law. So take German as a language that, that has its own fundamental uh, rules. Take, I remember this detail, eine Verkehrssicherungspflicht. Here in Trento, how do you translate a Verkehrssicherungspflicht? Let alone eine Verkehrssicherungspflichtsverletzung. Hmm? And you could go on. Well, <laughs> one of the rapporteurs had the guts to come up with the duty to secure traffic. That was not good, huh? That was very minimal as an attempt to, uh, but it, that's it, you know, how do you, and then, oh, no, 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 you know what? It's, a, it's, a, it, it's actually the duty of care. How do you know? There is no commensurability between the Verkehrssicherungspflicht and the duty of care. Both coexist. And so, other than the language, I mean, I come from a country that speaks at least four languages. And that's to say, on the surface. We then have three official languages, all equal, of course. You know. So Italian, French, and German. And you interpret federal law by looking at the meaning. Then there are people who are more equal than others. So out of the blue uh, the German version is actually the, the, the good one, but uh, it's not necessarily the case, I have to be honest. Um, let me just uh, add a little moment I had, a moment in time, as I call it, talking about emotions. I was in Solio this summer. I don't know if you have ever set a foot in Engadina or in the Bergel, Bregalia, one of these valleys in the canton of Graubünden, where they speak Italian. 
I enter a little store. I talk to a woman. And I said, what is your language? Well, she said, the official language is Italian. But I speak Bregaliotto or something like that, you know, <laughs> the local language. But of course, I hear you're from Bern. I say, yeah, how do you? Well, you know, Bern. And I, I speak, but I speak also Graubündnerdeutsch, uh, which is, you know, the German that they speak in that canton, let alone the fact that she speaks Italian, German, high German, Swiss German, and so forth. So that is what we're talking about when we're talking about Europe. We're talking about a multiplicity of, of sensibilities and that cannot but reflect in the law. So if we don't pay attention to language, we're going to miss fundamental dimensions of things. So, and I think that the unification and EU law has in large part failed because it doesn't speak the language that the people are expecting to hear. I mean, if you read a decision of the ECJ, written in English by professionals, you wonder in what English they speak. I mean, I run the test with my students at Georgetown. Yeah, do you think it's English? <laughs> they find it bizarre. It's EU English. It's disconnected. Why don't we pay attention to that? So, of course, so to make it short, the political failure has been total, the ignorance of the cultural dimension of law has been total, and so I come to my second and last point, a very short one, because I have not much to say. What do we do in the Common Core? Well, we try to avoid these mistakes. We pay attention more to English than, or to language. <laughs> this is an interesting lapsus. Um, <laughs> To, to language that we have done. You know, the tyranny of English is unavoidable. No? It's, it's, we are, until it becomes Chinese, for the moment, it still is English. And it's a tyranny. So, you know, when you think toward contract property, hmm? these divisions, it's a common law division, it's not a civil law division. So that's, but, you know, how do you cope with it? Uh, Let's do tort pop. It's enough. But let's be aware of what tricks language play on us and how, um, you know, let's explore. We talked a lot about Ole Lando. I remember him, you were there, Hugo, in 1997 in The Hague. And you were shouting, as you do, and it was wonderful. But I also overheard Ole who was shouting in the corridor and who was shouting a different song. You had at least, you attacked Marquezinis, it was wonderful. Um, he said, consideration has to go. Stupid. Uh, Mr. Lando, hold on here. How on earth can you seriously think that the Brits, who have a decent economy, some until now. Um, how can you think that consideration is just stupid? Of course, we in the Common Core never made that mistake. We never thought that there was out there a truth to unearth, although maybe we may have m had this wrong attitude. But, you know, we, we would always have avoided to say that consideration is stupid. But we were looking for equivalence you know, functional equivalence. Well, if the, we don't have consideration, maybe we have something equivalent. Let's look for that. No, no, let go. <laughs> let's explore what consideration is about, if we're still interested in consideration. Um, and, and let's explore what there is without making these analytical judgments as to unavoidably what should be. There's nothing that should be. There's nothing, there's no truth out there. There's only what we find out. So I guess uh, my plea or my, my plaidoyer for the survival and the future of the common core would be to pay attention more to culture. And now as I heard you this morning, you hid from us what you would say. I thought it was extremely interesting what you said. We need to engage in sociological evidence. We need to embark on finding out 
what is happening out there. And it seems to me that we haven't done that enough. The problem is, as I have always felt, is that we lawyers are totally unequipped to dig into the reality. So unavoidably, we stay on the surface and we play with our little categories and we're delighted with ourselves, except that we miss out there what's going on. But if we have to change or improve something, maybe we need to pay attention to the reality. Thank you. Thank you. As you see, our founding fathers are not so old and out of tune, notwithstanding the passing of time. But now, <laughs> <laughs> now, now it's time for listening to our young colleagues sitting at this table. The first to, uh, having to have the floor is Eleni uh, Zervojani from Thessaloniki. Thank you very much. And given the evident celebratory character of this meeting, I think that it would be appropriate to start by sharing a little bit of my personal experience with a Common Core project. So I first joined a Common Core group in 2007. It was the rather unfortunate personal injury group. But nevertheless, <laughs> my experience has been very positive because I got acquainted with a unique Common Core methodology. I met tort law experts from different uh, jurisdictions in a very relaxed atmosphere. But what I valued the most was that, well, I come from an academic setting where uh, universities have been democratized, but nevertheless, seniority and hierarchy play an important role. And to the, in the Common Core meetings, to the contrary, I always felt very comfortable as a young scholar, yes. and I was always invited to participate in discussions and contribute my thoughts and ideas on a fairly equal basis. And it has been in this spirit that Marta Infantino and myself were trusted in 2011 the causation project, which we then concluded in 2017. And for this wonderful opportunity, I would really like to uh, thank Professor Franz Vero, who was at the time chair of TORTS, and of course the general editors of the project, Professors Mara Busani and Ugo Matei. And of course I could talk in length about the exciting experience of editing such a project, but I think that it will be time to proceed on a little bit more scientific note, although I am fully on the same page with all the previous speakers. So when I was asked to talk on the tort law in the spotlight of European private law. Okay, I was obviously honored, but at the same time puzzled because the topic is broad, the literature on Europeanization of tort law is huge, and I wondered what I could add to the discussion. So the debate about unification or then more realistically harmonization of European tort law, be it under the name of a European civil code or not, and all the problems that are associated with it has been extensive. I think I do not need to talk here about the competence of the EU in general, the issues on legitimization, the choice of harmonization tools, the interdependence between tort law and other fields of law and all that. Uh, all these have been discussed at length and the discussion indeed has come to an end. Then in 2005, both the principles of European tort law and a first draft of the non-contractual liability arising out of damages caused to another, which was then later included in book six of the draft common frame of reference were published. Uh, both academic endeavors were based on a better law approach and have been extensively commented upon in the literature. So the question is, 10 years after the accomplishment of these works, actually more than 10 years, what are we left with? The draft common frame of reference has been named the sleeping beauty of European private law, although I suppose that beauty is a subjective quality. <laughs> and uh, the principles of European tort law have been more influential. They have been taken into consideration in projects for the reform of tort law liability in some countries, and they have also been cited by courts such, courts, such as the Lithuanian and the Spanish Supreme Courts. 
In the meantime, though, it seems to me that the discussion on European tort law has shifted. Uh, more recent works concentrate on EU tort law, be it the liability of EU bodies or member states for infringement of EU law or EU's secondary and still piecemeal uh, legislation on matters falling within the realm of tort law. With all that in mind, what I would like to do is assess the significance of a common core project and its contribution to the research and also, I think, evolution of European tort law. And I will attempt to do so, focusing on the example of causation. So, of course, it is a first tenet of tort law that there cannot be any liability without causation. And the term causation from a comparative uh, law perspective may be conceived narrowly as factual causation, typically assessed through the conditio sine qua non test, or in a more broad way, including issues pertaining to the so-called legal causation, which actually defines the scope of liability that is actually uh, contribution. And yet, despite the key function of causation in its widest sense as to the establishment and extent of liability, we are actually far from any consensus as to its harmonization. The rules on causation um, uh, in Book 6 of the draft common frame of reference are kept to a minimum. Uh, there is a general basic rule on causation <coughs> that explicitly states that, well, causation is a, causation, a condition of tort liability. But it does not go much further than that. The term causation is used in a broad sense to cover both issues of factual and legal causation, but no relevant distinction is made between them. As the drafters of the draft common frame of reference note, it is not the function of this article to attach itself firmly to a defined theoretical position within the broad spectrum of opinion. The width and complexity of the subject do not speak in favor of a precise rule on causation. And following the same line of thought, the draft common frame of reference does not provide for any specific rules on the proof of causation, leaving the issue to the applicable law of evidence and affording the judge a certain amount of discretion which may and must be exercised. Then there are two further articles that regulate causation in specific settings. The first one pertains to the establishment on causation in case of intentionally inflicted damaged by participants, instigators, and accessories, say, for example, the liability of a gang of thieves. And the second one regards a cert uncertain causation, but deals explicitly only with one particular uh, scenario, namely the one of multiple potential tort feasors. Here, the famous uh, hunting example, there are more persons that shoot at a certain victim, the victim gets injured, but it cannot be ascertained uh, which hunter shot that particular shot. Uh, so here's, of course, not the place to go into further details regarding this position, and I think that what I have already mentioned is enough to pose the, causation, the, the question. Even if all obstacles and reservations as to harmonization of tort law were lifted. Could these rules serve to this end? Actually, obviously, they could not. The general rule is simply too general, and the following two rules are simply too specific, and they leave disputed issues of uh, causation, such as uncertain causation, where certain causes uh, pertain to chance events, totally untouched. So even if all conditions of tort liability, like in case of fault liability, wrongfulness and damage, were perfectly unified in Europe, the diversity of outcomes would be unavoidable and the only possible effect of such an endeavor would be perhaps the change in the line of argumentation of national courts. But the question is on this basis, why go into the whole trouble of harmonization in the first place? So. Then the principles on European tort law, on the other hand, and this is one of the significant differences compared to the draft common frame of reference as to the contents, have many and specific rules on causation. The term causation is actually reserved for factual causation, and legal causation is treated in a separate section in the, on the scope of liability. In respect of factual causation, the condition sine qua non test is explicitly adopted allowing for an exception in cases of causal overdetermination. While there are further articles 
that deal with causal preemption or uh, uncertain causation covering all possible scenarios. And in case of uncertain causation, they opt for proportional liability. Under such a rule, then each potential tortfeasor is liable for a percentage of the damage defined by the probability that his behavior or activity led to it. From a comparative law perspective, it is clear that European jurisdictions are very deeply divided when it comes to uncertain causation. Apart from Austria and the Netherlands, where case law has adopted rules on proportional liability, and then possibly also Lithuania, that shows some increased reliance to the rules of the principles, uh, all other countries follow more or less an all or nothing uh, solutions with occasional deviations on the basis of the doctrine of a loss of a chance. Then the rules on the proof for causation are crucial for the establishment of causation and what the research of Martin Fantino and myself uh, actually concluded to is that the outcomes are overtly uh, context dependent. Against this background, the, European, uh, the group on European tort law evidently decided to opt for better law. And proportional liability in cases of causal uncertainty is a clear-cut solution, and I personally subscribe to that. However, it entails a change of paradigm. The adoption of uh, such a rule, which draws mainly on the preventive rather than compensatory faction of tort law, pertains to major policy consideration, and for many national jurisdictions, that would be uh, too big of a step to take. Uh, when it comes to the scope of liability, then uh, the principles, in the principles there is a list of a number of factors that have to be taken into account when deciding the issue, such as foreseeability, the protected scope of the rule, ordinary risks of lives, the type of laws and the grounds for uh, liability. Uh, of course, this is another evidence of uh, the Wilbur Wilburg's uh, flexible system approach adopted throughout the principles that seek to strike a balance between flexibility and certainty. Uh, however, the research of Martin Fantino and myself on causation uh, made us fully aware of the fact that the views of different jurisdictions on the scope of liability differ, even when the same words, such as foreseeability and adequacy, are used. On this premise, uh, I, I doubt actually that any rule uh, could harmonize that at the point, at the time being. And especially not so in the absence of a uh, European court for civil law matters. But even if such a court existed, uh, the experience on referrals from national courts uh, before the Court of Justice of the European Union for preliminary rulings indicates, for instance, that national courts would rather declare an issue clear and undisputed than file for a request. And having said that, I would like very shortly to note that the existing EU rules on causation are also not apt for generalization. Such rules are largely absent from the secondary legislation of EU, like the Product Liability Directive, although here we have to note the recent, relatively recent, vaccine ruling of the Court of Justice of the European Union that allowed for the assessment of uh, scientific uncertainty uh, on the basis of circumstantial evidence. But anyway, genuine EU rules on causation can be found in the case law of the Court of Justice pertaining mostly to non-contractual liability of the EU and member state liability for infringement of EU law. So the condition for the establishment of liability is the existence of a certain and direct causal link with certainty pertaining actually to factual causation and directness to legal causation issues. Nevertheless, the concept of directness is extremely fuzzy. And yes, undoubtedly, national laws of the member states permeate its understanding. And since we have some case law, uh, the concept is somehow concretized. But this case law uh, of uh, the Court of European uh, Union pertains to very specific settings, and it is doubtful it, if it could apply to typical tort law disputes between private persons, because even the very own aim of uh, tort liability in EU law draws mainly on prevention 
and this does not necessarily coincide with the aims of national tort laws. And even the existence of causation context, uh, concepts developed by the Court of Justice of the EU does not prevent these rules being perceived through the lenses of national law. A striking example taken from a relatively recent work on causation in EU law is reading into the case law of the Court of Justice of the EU, the German distinction between Haftungsbegründete causalität, which refers to the causal connection between the defendant's behavior or activity and the infringement of a protected legal interest, and Haftungsausfühlende causalität, which refers to the causal connection between this infringement and the losses that incurred. This distinction has practical significance in Germany as regards the applicable standard of proof, which in the case of Haftungsausfüllende Causalität is more relaxed. Nevertheless, not only this distinction is totally absent from any other European jurisdiction, but it does not seem to have any practical significance at all in the framework of European uh, Union liability schemes. So from all the above observations, uh, the significance of the Common Core project, especially to well, this audience, uh, may have already become evident. Namely, I think that projects that aim at formulating a general rule, uh, of course they are based on extensive comparative analysis of European jurisdictions. However, the aim of formulating such a rule in itself actually um, entails some biases. Uh, there is... Uh, probably an unavoidable tendency to overstate the similarities and understate the differences. And uh, for the Common Core project, on the other hand, the unearthing of what is already common, if anything, between European private laws is a name in itself. And its unique methodology is already known to you. But what I would like to stress is that the main difference between the Common Core uh, as compared to the other uh, project is that what matters is not simply the law as applied in practice, but the interrelation between legal institution and also non-legal elements that may affect uh, judicial outcomes. On this basic uh, basis and on the specific context of uh, causation, the final result of the research of Marta Infantino and myself was that the differences across uh, European jurisdiction lie not so much in the set of rules applicable to solving causation problems, but rather in the underlying language, notions, and ways of framing this problem, uh, that is, in the traditional reservoir of methods and technicalities embedded in its jurisdiction legal cart culture. And these are often the hardest to detect and not to mention change. So coming now to the conclusion of my presentation, and back to the more general topic of tort law in the context of European private law. Well, actually, in theory, I think that I would, live, I would like to live in a country where the principles of European tort law would be the tort law in force. But this country does not exist. Probably Aust Austria is close to that, but not quite. And even if the principles were enacted in a given country, this would not uproot this country's tort law culture. So, currently there is not even a consensus among European jurisdictions as regards the aims and factions of tort law. So, of course, the discussion on harmonization has ended, more or less. Uh, and I think that it could be uh, revisited in the future, provided that for some reason there is strong political will to pursue it. But in the meantime, uh, what can and should be done is to further investigate the deep patterns that underlie traditional solution and techniques and strengthen the knowledge about European legal tradition, exactly like the Common Core project, but also the digest, the digest of European um, tort law and the casebook project uh, strive to do. So this knowledge building process may gradually, very gradually, uh, foster a uh, common European uh, legal culture and then a hundred years from now perhaps eventually a future top-down uh, approach for harmonization uh, could be easier. So 25 years after the initiation of the Common Core project I think that it already has a great legacy 
project sets as the ones on pure economic losses and strict liability. I really believe that they have had an impact on the quality of scientific dialogue on these issues. And there is still a lot of work that can uh, be done both in traditional and currently hot topics of tort law. And especially after yesterday's general session of tort law, I'm very confident that uh, the, common law, the Common Core uh, project will go with exciting projects in the future. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Eleni. Uh, now it's the turn of uh, the other non-EU citizens sitting at this table. Uh, um, Rima Chichakian, if I... Yeah, that's... From that's Moscow. Not, yeah. From it's, Moscow it's fine. You School of Social and Economic Sciences. Chichakian, Chichakian, it's, it's both correct. First of all, I would like to thank you all, uh, all those who are on this table, all the organizers. Thank you, Gamate, for inviting me, and, uh, um, of course, Mara Busani for sitting here with me, and all of, all of the presented here with all the speeches were uh, so on me because I am actually on the same page as you, and I feel that uh, all the views that were presented um, are actually uh, same as mine. So, not to doubling uh, everything that was mentioned, I will try to focus on my observations on tort law. So, I will start from general pattern view, a world view as a whole, as I can see in tort law, and then I will have a specific focus on the prospective li liabilities. So, as was mentioned by Professor Raymond, tort law is not much uh, financial, not so much about financial market, but uh, more in other spheres. But I would like to add that uh, there is a tendency of expanding tort law. So, starting from the mentioned Guido Calabresi's. Uh, Thesis, uh, he wrote that tort liability may be regarded as a way to internalize negative externalities. So recently we may observe a tendency to expand tort law, um, application of tort law, which, uh, which uh, indicates the expansion of internalization of uh, negative externalities. Moreover, the line between the contractual remedies beyond the differences in European Union uh, countries uh, is more blue. So the reality, however, is not so simple. Uh, I would like also, as an example, give uh, the Russian experience of tort law that is also, also lies on the uh, expanding the scope of application of tort law. So in Russia, tort law begins to revive and rise from the oblivion. So there are two very interesting cases recently uh, that was in 2017 and 2018 that really gave the rise to the tort law. So the first one is Beaumarchais case and the second one is Magadan test. Magadan test is also applicable to the prospectus liability, which is very interesting because it's actually the first case that not only uh, applied to the pure economic losses, that is very, very inherent to the Roman civil legislation, R Russian civil legislation, because in the civil court in 2064 article of the civil code of Russia, there is no such thing as financial losses. There are only harm in a tort law, there are only harm to the property and to the individual. Which means that till now, till the, the last year, uh, in tort law there were just two kind of losses and financial losses were more connected to the property rights. So it is more like to have damaged property, not the financial losses and not a pure economic losses at all. So. There is an interesting example of how courts started to interpret that article. So they decided that the financial losses and pure economic losses should rise. That's why 
application of pure economic losses in the spheres where the information was provided to the third parties, it was actually revolutionary. So this trend is outlined due to the development of this kind of commercial, not non-contractual relations. As we can see, there are two different trends in European Union countries. First of all, one thing that they have to expand toward law liabilities, toward claims. For example, when they talk about pre-contractual liability, for example, in Italian cases, there are a lot of cases, of course it is controversial, but a lot of cases talk about that pre-contractual liability is more tort law. And there are, uh, there are, uh, they experience this through the case law. And there are, of course, cases in German law that they think that it is more contract liability than tort law, which is actually can be the same. In Russian, they used to say it tort monster because it is not contractual and <laughs> not tort, so it couldn't be both. It is either tort or contract law. So, but we have to domesticate this tort monster and develop criteria for the admissibility of the recovery as well as the recovery of pure economic losses, which is so inherent to Russian law. So the last case, Magadan test, that I mentioned, it is actually one of the example of prospectus liability case, as can be applied by as analogy. For example, Magadan test was, um, ah, and also I would like to add that <laughs> I forgot that actually in Russia tort uh, claims are usually some sort of backup for those who couldn't, uh, couldn't uh, bring a contractual claim. Uh, for example, in Magadan test, when um, the person suffered because of the information of the certification company, he applied firstly the contractual claim, and then after that, tort claim, which is, which is very interesting because it means that tort law is not so developed as it is in European Union. But as I can see, case law is very important for analyzing the tendency. And as I can see, the tendency to expand toward law, especially in prospectus liability, is also very important in European Union. And because of the fact that there are different views of whether to apply fault causation in such cases, it is very difficult to harmonize all these cases, especially in cross-border litigation. For example, the last case that was uh, a year before today, like 2018, in European Court of Justice, um, they were deciding whether prospectus liability is a tort law, uh, is a tort claim at all, or non and non-contractual relations covered. And they were trying to find the location of pure economic losses uh, that were made because of the information that was published in the prospectus. Which is actually very strange because if we are talking about harm to the property, we can say, well, damage occurs. When we talk about the harm to the individual, we may say, where well, the damage occurs. But when we talk about financial losses, it is very difficult because there is... Uh, uh, first market, there is secondary market, there is a, a lot of markets that are related to that prospectus and that is very hard to say when and where uh, the person actually um, occur, where, where and when the loss occurred uh, and damages. So basically the most important uh, part is was to divide the causation factors of when and where the damage occurred because connecting it only with a bank account would be maybe a little bit misleading because the person could open that bank account anywhere, and he did that. The bank accounts were worldwide through all the European Union countries, and it would be difficult to say that uh, connecting the damage to the bank account is a good, a, a good reason. So the second uh, option that I saw that... Um, uh, the tendency that I saw is uh, the case-by-case -case regulation in this kind of um, uh, in this kind of uh, cases, because in tort law there is a tendency when because of the abstract institution in civil courts or regulations, judges have uh, a lot of power to decide 
on a case-by-case -case basis. For example, they have to analyze the behavior of the publisher of that information, whether it was gross negligence, negligence, or intention. And it is very important also uh, for the European Union countries because there is a diversification of different countries. For example, in Germany, they see it only through the intentional prism, and France sees it as negligence and gross negligence. But the second observation that I made in this situation, case law preserves balancing, as I say, invisible hand of tort law. Because the case law shows that um, all those countries who see as negligence, gross negligence, and intentional behavior of the publisher, it brings to the, to the equilibrium that those cases are usually judged to the uh, gross negligence basis. And in those countries, when uh, there is more intentional, pro-intentional views, they usually see that it might be slighted, it might be, um, it might be uh, m more easier to say that maybe this person should be more gross negligent to that information than intentionally put that information as, uh, in addition as in prospectus. Because putting some information for auditors, consultants, and other companies intentionally, uh, that would cause a lot of uh, problems and issues uh, in burden of proof and proof as well. So, as I say, judges, the third tendency that I, um, that I see in tort law is that judges usually try to analyze behavior of publisher and uh, the customer, the investors who buy these securities, which is actually also proven in the European Court of Justice case where judge is trying to understand the behavior when this investor made a mistake, uh, be, relied on that information, which is actually um, maybe is not the, uh, the best way to understand where the damages occurred. So uh, the third point of uh, tendencies is that actually uh, there is, uh, there, there needs, uh, the, the case law needs guidelines to, to balance this kind of situation where the judge has to understand whether, whether the behavior was because that it, that, that it is more uh, standard behavior for a group of investors. And basically what I do like in this decision is that uh, they actually put aside uh, the causation of where was, when was made this information relied to the customer. And it was based on the understanding of whether this information was spread in national jurisdiction of the secondary market, because uh, that's, that's the understanding of when the person could probably read this, this prospectus. And what is interesting in such cases is that there are a lot of fictions. Uh, for example, the fiction of that the investor actually read that information. Maybe he didn't read and even didn't understand that. So uh, uncontrolled expansions of this practice can create a lot of problems and difficult to control this. So in Europe, this is one of the most uh, um, actively discussed issues, and some countries take a very restrained approach and tend to expand the scope of contractual liability rather than open the floodgates tort law. So claims for, for, for such kind of cases. Um, and uh, others have opened the door to tort law and allow fairly broad recovery of, for example, pure economic losses. And not only in Europe, but as we can see in Russia, it is developing as well. So uh, uh, one of my inter con conclusions would be to provide a very slight guidance to uh, understand the, the standards of... Uh, such prospectus liability and uh, fault uh, understanding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now it's time for the um, uh, chair uh, of the groups to come over and uh, um, present um, the results of the 
of the meetings, of the group meetings. Aurelia. Aurelia will start also because yeah, she has to leave, right? Thank you very much, Paul. Just one second that I open the file. So we have a very intensive and uh, enjoyable meeting of the contract group yesterday morning. Um, we have nine projects, actually. Uh, two of them are completed already. Uh, two of them are advanced. Um, and the other ones have just started. And perhaps one uh, has dead prematurely, unfortunately. But however, so the ones who are completed, interpretation of commercial contracts. Editors Laura McGregor, David Cabrelli, both University of Edinburgh, and uh, Yap by University of Leiden. And the manuscript is now in the hands of Intersentia and uh, will hopefully be published in April. And then the second is uh, Immoral Contracts in Europe. Uh, editors Chantal Mack, Amsterdam, Sishan Mansour, Leiden, and myself. And also, this manuscript is in the hands of Intersentia. And um, I have understood from Mauro that uh, uh, four months are um, the deadline um, expected. Right, then, um, the other manuscripts, uh, Contractual Remedies. This is a very nice project. It was quite advanced already in the past years, but now it seems to be proceeding at a slower pace, and I'm still awaiting from, uh, for the last updates by the editor, so I'm, I'm a bit worried about this project. And um, third party rights in contract law. This is um, a project uh, edited by Lorna Richardson, uh, Edinburgh, and Jan Beam and Utrecht. The project in a is in a very good shape. Uh, 10 of the 13 reports are ready. The editors have given feedback on the draft reports recently. And um, already last year, the completion of the book manuscript was expected in 2020, 2021. And I think they are very good on schedule to achieve this goal, uh, despite of uh, the maternity leave of Lorna. And um, then uh, we devoted most of the time yesterday uh, for the discussion to uh, the discussion of a new project, a project idea launched last year already. And this year, the project has uh, really started. The editors are Professor Nikita Sadzimihail from the University of Cyprus, uh, who is uh, present today. Uh, then uh, Dr. Stelios Tofaris, uh, University of Cambridge. Uh, he has been a university lecturer in Cambridge for 20 years already, so he will represent the common law perspective. And um, Eleftherios Foglis from the University of Athens. And this project is on ascertaining the content of the contract, incorporation, gap filling, and implied terms. So, and it's important um, to safeguard that the overlap uh, between the interpretation of commercial contracts um, project and book and this new project um, will be managed so that uh, um, the incorporation and gap filling and implied terms uh, project will deal uh, with the, uh, new other questions, questions not already addressed by the interpretation of commercial contracts uh, volume. And the plan is that the first draft questionnaire is expected for January 2020, and there will be an informal meeting either in Cyprus or in Cambridge uh, to discuss the draft before discussing it at the next Common Core meeting. Right, then uh, a second new project we have discussed yesterday uh, was launched already last year by uh, Professor Christian Chak, uh, University of Trnava, Slovakia. Uh, also with, uh, uh, together with the support of uh, his colleague, Professor Monika Jurkova, also from the same university. And uh, they are now looking for um, a third editor with a common law background to complement the perspectives. And uh, the theme, the topic is contracts in the sharing economy. And uh, so they have funding at the University of Trnava for this project. And they have also a deadline for the funding. So they want actually to finish the project in 2022, which is a good uh, motivation to proceed with a, a good uh, pay, uh, with, with a speedy pace. And uh, also for this project, a questionnaire uh, is expected to be uh, a first draft in January 2020, and then again uh, to be discussed uh, at the next Common Core meeting. 
Then we have discussed very briefly a couple of other potential uh, new ideas for future Common Core projects. One on limitation, an idea proposed by Professor Francesco Astone from Foggia. And uh, also here the brainstorming is about who could be a possible co-editor from a common law background. And then another project idea is uh, uh, on smart contracts in European contract law, which is a very ch a challenging project because smart contracts are not smart and are not contracts. <laughs> so it's, uh, <laughs> it's interesting. And uh, the idea comes from the University of Malta, Professor Ivan Samut, Samut and um, they also have funding at the University of Malta for research on this topic, on smart contracts. And the challenge is how different national legal systems deal with uh, this new phenomenon. And uh, then the, that project, uh, actually it was uh, uh, this project idea. We had the first draft questionnaire already, transfer of debt. And the editors were um, Miguel Adame and Joel Samuelson. Miguel Adame uh, from Sevilla and uh, Joel, Sam Joel Samuelson um, uh, from um, uh, from Sweden, and uh, but uh, yeah, no reaction. So uh, I I have no idea. Probably the pro the project is dead. Uh, also the uh, Laura uh, McGregor and David Cabrelli for uh, the interpretation of commercial contract project have had no reaction from Joel uh, when they asked him to update the national report. So, but uh, apart from that, so you see, eight running projects. Uh, the Common Core is really alive and kicking. Thank you very much. Uh, Marta? <laughs> so everything went very well also on the third law side. We have four projects two very well and alive, one starting and one maybe dead, maybe comatose, maybe reviving, it's a little bit unclear. Uh, maybe next year we will have uh, better news. So the two ongoing projects are the Products Liability Project led by Monica Jodzon and Markus Pilgastofer. They have 10 national reports. Uh, they are planning to send the, um, they are they planning to ask for an update on early 2020 to the reporters and then to write the comparative summary and close the book in the mid of 2020. So very hopefully the publisher is gonna get the manuscript in the mid of 2020 and that's the plan. Then there is the Reasonable Conduct Project led by Richard Wright, Miguel Martin Casals and Piotr Makinovsky, uh, which is going very well and very fast as well. They have 14 national reports already filed in. They, were, they spent these two and three days discussing them, uh, and I think they will go very smooth till, uh, and they will end up their work soon. Then we discussed yesterday a new project led by Thomas Arons and Rianca Rinot about mass damages. And I must say the project is really, really good. The questionnaire is about damages to a lot of people. So like damages caused by climate change or earthquakes or financial crisis, uh, terrorism, um, oil spills, etc. And they are looking uh, for national reporters. So whoever is interested to step in uh, and be part of this new project, just contact either Rianca or me if you don't, I mean, if you prefer, and then I will send your name to her. Then the last one of the four um, is what we thought was the dead personal injury project that was already mentioned before. Um, we had the idea of trying to revive that project and transforming it into something new, like a personal injury project with a focus on quantum. And we had two very brave candidates uh, to work as editor, which are Eleni and Christina Sieg from Southern Denmark University. But unfortunately, Christina, it's not clear whether Christina will be able to, um, to go ahead with that project. So if whoever is, if who, there is somebody who is interested in taking care of it, we are still uh, here and we are still waiting for um, somebody willing to do that. Okay, so that's more or less the situation. Thank you. And now the property group, uh, Filippo.
Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much to the uh, general editors, first of all, and thank you very much to the organizers. We've had uh, as well a successful uh, work group meeting yesterday and a successful group meeting today. Uh, we have a few projects which are alive and going. I'm going to tell you all about it. We had actually two presentations yesterday for the two projects which are uh, approximating the finishing line or at least are presumptively approximating the finishing line. Uh, the first project is, which has gone very, very smoothly, is the project on the acquisition of land through long-term use by Björn Hopes and Ernst Marie. Uh, and this project has uh, all the reports and also the conclusions uh, finished, which were presented yesterday by Björn. And, um, uh, the only thing that actually is left to do in terms of completing the text is a sort of um, uniforming the standards of the different reports. There was one report which actually followed the um, uh, common core structure really closely. The others were uh, less uh, disciplined, let's say, and now we are, uh, or rather Bjorn and Ernst are in the process of uh, bringing uh, the whole herd together in a, a common direction, but it's, uh, as far as I understand, it should not be a very complicated process, and this thing is indeed ongoing. And then we have had, uh, after a very long, instead, development, a, an update on the boundaries to information uh, property. And this is a project which I learned yesterday, actually, has been going for since the very beginning. Uh, it was, uh, which is fitting for the 25th anniversary, I think. Uh, and and it has had a change in 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 editors, so it's not it's not something that one specific editor has has taken from the beginning to the end. But now, the editors are Christine Gott, which presented her conclusions yesterday. Uh, Gertrude van Overwalle, Lucy Gibo, and Derek uh, Beglevelt. And and uh, the 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 uh, the, the process in, in the space that where I as and Alessandra as chairs of the property group will read the text and, and comment the text in order to send it uh, further to the general editors. Um, the one problem which may arise is in terms of update because the the reports are uh, have been delivered but have been delivered a long time ago and this is. Uh, an area of the law related to technology, uh, so probably fast, fast going. Uh, there has been presented an argument quite strongly by Christine yesterday that this might actually not be such a big issue in the sense that uh, this is not a commentary, as we often say. It has to do rather with, with defining difference in structures in the law, and the structures of the law have not changed very much, so it might be less of a problem than it seems, but this is something we have to uh, analyze and, and, and discuss and address. So that's the big you know, question mark on, on the whole project. But I think uh, nonetheless that it is very positive that this project as well is you know, approaching the finishing line. Then an update on the Access to the Commons uh, project. This is also a project which has, I think because of the nature of the questionnaire, the nature of the, the issue itself has had a quite long uh, phase and is now actually approaching, I think, a point of almost being finished in the sense that uh, there has been a, a good, very good idea by Hugo Mattei to converge uh, the resources of the Common Core with the uh, resources, resources and the network of the International Academy of Comparative Law, which has allowed us to find uh, um, more reporters. I should say that the, the, the project is uh, edited by Hugo Mattei, Alessandra Quart, and myself. And now we have 16 reports, and, and the only um, core uh, legal system missing is the French legal system. But this is a very good improve. It's, it's, it's a very good improvement co uh, considering where we uh, were uh, just a few, a few years ago. Uh, okay, when it comes instead to uh, new projects or new ideas, uh, there is nothing really that has been presented uh, in a more detailed manner, but uh, a few subjects have been discussed. Uh, the abandonment of property is one subject which the group has shown interest for. 
Another interesting subject are um, uh, concerns the internal organization of the commons, which might be a follow-up to the, to the access to the commons uh, project. Uh, I should also add, uh, ending and, and wrapping this up, that uh, there is a little bit of a hiccup in one of the projects, meaning the um, uh, sorry, uh, the residential immovables project headed by Martiniemi and Peter Sparks, because Peter Sparks has retired not only from his uh, uh, pr professorship, but also from uh, his role as editor of the project. So um, I talked to Matti, it's still a bit, a bit unsure if they need another editor. And um, as far as the, the reports go, uh, they have all the reporters, but only half of them have delivered so far. So that's where the project stands. I think it's a, it's a, the positive note is that we have a few projects uh, in the pipeline. Sorry. Ah, yes. One another 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 project which was suggested today was a closer look of the, on the property of data. But uh, we should probably first, you know, check how overlapping this is with Christine Gott's project. But that is one another idea which which was ventilated today. Thank you very much. Okay, good. Now the, the floor is open to any questions, uh, comments uh, on what you heard this morning. If there are no questions, uh, we are approaching lunchtime, but all right. So, okay, okay. Oh, Luisa, 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 Luisa has something to say. Good. Um, I was uh, very much interested about the fact that today I think the emphasis was very much on the fact that um, no codification should be pursued. It must, wasn't just a failure, but it was right that it failed. Um, and that there are the multiplicity or the variety of law is an essential element and, and then also the specificity of the European setting, which I think is really a crucial element about not just cultural diversity, but linguistic diversity, which is a crucial element, not just because uh, language and culture go together, but I think uh, legal language has a specificity in itself, which does not compare to any other science. And, and therefore, we should be not just aware, but uh, um, make out something of that. So, for example, the fact that we use English as a lingua franca is a necessity, but it has a number of consequences. On the other hand, I have the sense, and, and, and this was the reaction that came on, on my presentation yesterday, where about the fact that something is happening, different than we expected, but something is happening, both in, in terms of producing rules, because the, they were mentioned that um, the PECLE and the DCFR have been used to reform national codes. And now, of course, today with Matthias, we, we were saying it doesn't really mean that they're going to converge, it might produce any kind of result, but still, it's something that is going on. Uh, legal harmonization, piecemeal harmonization in Europe is continuing. Mauro made the example of a possible codification. So, a lot of is going on, and also on the point of view of the cultural dimension, things are changing. Um, and we're part of it. I mean, the Common Core is, is, is part of that enterprise. So the distinction between the purely analytical framework and the fact that the analytical framework is finally leading to some consequences is a most interesting element and, and probably something that in these 25 years has changed and, and, and probably it reflects into what we are doing and what we are going to do in the future. So that was just a thought. Thank you. Well, I guess I would like to follow up and confess my ignorance of the linguistic dimensions of the law when I started the endeavor of being or trying to be a comparativist. I mean, we should pay attention to what linguists say 
about the untranslatability of things. And it is striking to see that none of the comparative lawyers in recent history have paid any attention really to the problem of language. I mean, if you take the big treatises in comparative law, they do not mention the problem of translation. It's striking. Now, more recent studies may have changed a little bit the reality, but it remains taken for granted that you can translate from one language to the other. And this is strange. Think of how, and maybe you will think that this is a literary example, but Beckett, who's lived in France, who writes a very successful play, En attendant Godot, says, well, I'm Irish, so why don't I translate? And he discovers that or he can't. He does not translate it. The play, he says, has nothing to do with En attendant Godot. Waiting for Godot has... So I don't want to go into this, but I guess we have to be unbelievably careful when we assume the translatability of languages. And it is striking to think that the European private law people were all engaged in to gathering. I mean, I, was, I had the privilege of being the Swiss observer, as be, not being an EU, uh, in the Lando group. It was incredible to see what was happening, the rapport de force, that, you know, who gets to talk. So ultimately, you know, back then we were 16 people, 16 representatives of 16 EU jurisdictions. things that I have to, su to suggest to you. I don't think it's true what you said about the fact that the translation is not an issue in the major, I mean, for example, in the Schlesinger one, uh, we actually uh, put it a, a big chapter on translation, practical and theoretical questions. There is all the people working around SACO that do like uh, this, kind of, this kind of work. The only point is that I, I find, uh, there was Pierre Legrand who made uh, arguments like that uh, using for, for a long period of time getting a lot of citations by doing that um, it's just very boring I think quite frankly I mean it's just something that is just something that uh, uh, it is a dimension of intellectualism that doesn't really fit uh, the sort of uh, modest nitty-gritty kind of uh, practical uh, nature if you want of private law of our law in general. I mean, it's lovely to have to be this intellectual and, and, and being philosophers, but in, in a way, the, the legal profession is a learned profession, but we should be very modest also in what ultimately uh, is, our, is our business, our, our cultural limits, our capacities to get out of you know, certain kind of cages. And what I think was quite a good, uh, uh, maybe an explanation, I don't know whether good or bad, an explanation that we are here still around uh, with the common core, uh, we really changed the, the attitude towards the sort of early, very strict rules that we were trying to enforce when we didn't want it to have you around, for example, at the beginning because you were Swiss and you remember. I or do. when we when we were extremely strict <laughs> about you know sort of the, the what is the private law even about the con the, the boundaries of that we discussed like crazy about property contract tort as theoretical categories ultimately in 25 years with the wisdom of aging uh, we've seen that uh, they pretty much worked we, we we know who goes to the contract group to the property group to the tort group without having much of a stress on that uh, 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 we got a lot of more people not from European country whenever by chance or by necessity, you know, someone was involved. We had South African people involved. We have... We, we keep inviting them. Yeah, we, we, keep, we keep having you around and, and, and we love to have you around mm -hmm. now. We are all happy. And, uh, and so all of that also kind of we move beyond that. Uh, even the sort of positive normative uh, map, that was a discussion we started, but I never have time to spend time with, with Mauro, so, but we have in this 35 seconds, he gave me this, this 
in these three days, we had a, a little discussion <laughs> about, uh, you know, the sort of, uh, of uh, um, whether, whether this idea of the maps uh, is still accurate, the attempt to draft, you know, a map that arrives gives the idea of a very sort of neutral thing, but then it's not really neutral because, you know, now there is a huge literature about mappings and, and how that is an assertion of power, which becomes a particularly strong now in the age of the computer languages. So the language thing is not just translating from English to French to German or to, it's also translating in algorithmic language, which nobody understands. Uh, and and we, have, we need someone to translate it for us. And then if they don't give a damn, you know, they, we have no way to check anyway, because even this morning, the, the thing of transparency that Mauro came out with, you know, we should know how the algorithms are done and, 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 and we should be informed in plain language. Great, you know, then they inform you in plain language and then they program it in a different way. A, a, a clique of people that have a very internal and, and accessible skill set of tools and then the law is screwed, basically, you know, and it happens a lot, right? I mean, that, 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 and these are also issues of translation in a sense. So I don't think we have to, uh, we, we didn't try to solve the, the problems of the world. I, I think we've been doing some contributing in a modest way as lawyers, and perhaps that's uh, not much more than that that we can, we, 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 can, we can try doing. Being pretty aware that, you know, we tried not to be positivist, we try not to believe in Santa Claus, that the private law is not political, but we actually survive because of that. And many of the more pathetic kind of abstract, uh, you know, lawyers uh, kind of technical claims of being different and neutral and a lot of the stuff Matthias was saying, you know, the debate at the beginning about the use commu European uh, use commune and all that discussion, people pretending to be Savigny and other people pretending to be Thibault and whatever, I think it's gone, you know. We, 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 as a profession, we just don't keep ourselves, take ourselves so seriously anymore, and perhaps that's very good. I was just trying to give an account of why I think that the political project failed. And I think, in large part, it did fail because of cultural obstacles that had not been taken into account. So we might say, you know, we're these intellectuels who are playing with words and we are complicating things, the nitty-gritty. No, the, the daily business of a lawyer is unbelievably culturally loaded. And all I'm saying is that for the common core, by the way, I'm not sure the common and core are still good expressions, but leaving that aside, because we, uh, there is no, no, yeah, well, <laughs> it's an easy counterattack. Let's, let's deal with what we are doing. And I think that the political failure gives us warning signs about what instead we could be doing. And I think we've been doing great. The best evidence for that is that we're still here and still loving it. But I think that from the political failure, we need to learn. What can we learn? Mauro was suggesting that we look at facts more carefully. Um, and I think we, we cultivate, I guess, the idea that this is unbelievably difficult. That's the, the, the point. And then we can, you know, uh, reduce it to a Lagrandism. Actually, the merit of Lagrand has to be disturbing the assumptions that comparative law people were making all along, thinking that they were converging. No, they were not. So, let's. Yeah, but people vote with speed sometimes. Yes. You know, like, for example, legal culture, like the French legal culture, not the common core, voted with their feet. We have no French reports. And why is that? The yeah. Yeah. Well, that's in the comparative data that someone who does comparative work using the materials we are offering them will we'll observe. And yeah. uh, you know, there was a long period of time in Europe, 25 years, in which France was doing politically making deal with Germany and being influential, legally being so chauvinistic not to participate or, you know, so resisting not to want to dirty her hands with you know, other people, that's a data, is a metadata. Yeah, so it's not yeah. something that we've been conscious in producing, but this is what happened in our 25 years. 
this is a metadata that someone that will reflect, you know, five years from now, or even on no. our work, we clearly know this. Yeah. But what can we do? You know, we, we, we had limits on, on uh, we should, should we, like, uh, decide to... to Respect the absence yeah, yeah. or understand the absence because yeah. it's not just that they were no. voting with their feet. There were deep reasons why the French did not show up. And I think it's interesting to take the measure of their absence and sure. reflect without uh, judging. Now it's Matthias that wants to say something. I wouldn't, I, wouldn't be so sure. Sure, I wouldn't be so sure that the language is an insurmountable obstacle. The European Union has been extremely successful legislating um, to no end. I mean, they produce legislation at a pace and on a scope that is, you know, flabbergasting. And they do it all the time. They just don't do it very successfully in private law. But even here they have done it. I mean, they've produced tons of consumer legislation, which is implemented in lots of countries, not only product liability, but particularly contract law, uh, you know, and, and contract terms and so forth. Tons of it. They produce tons of private international law, uh, jurisdiction, and so forth. They have just not succeeded in producing anything remotely uh, um, similar, similar to a European civil code. So I'm not sure the language barriers seem to be able to, to they seem to be able to manage the language barriers. I would, I would I'm, not, I'm not denying what you're saying, Franz. I think it plays a major role. It also plays a major role who these people are who drive the process. They're not private lawyers. They're bureaucrats. They're administrative people. They understand the language of regulations and of directives and, and so forth, right? They, they don't think in code terms. And in some sense, um, when, you, when you ask yourself, when have codifications ever been successful across language barriers? There are very few examples. The Swiss are one of the examples, right? But maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. But, but there are very few examples where private law codification or, or major classical codification, criminal law, private law, have been successful across language barriers. I cannot come up historically with more than, I don't know, maybe even only the Swiss example. Right? And this, this is not only a, a civil or common law thing. Uh, overcoming in private law, a core project of private law overcoming language barrier is particularly difficult. Not in all legislation, but particularly in these areas. And I'm not sure that it's only language. It, it's it's got to be other things as well. It's got to be cultural attitudes, mm -hmm. got to be pride. Look at the French, right? I mean, they weren't giving up the civil code is a major, major thing for them. But the Germans giving up the big is a major thing. And, and so it, I, it, it's not only the language, it's the underlying attitude also. And I have suspected from the very beginning the lack of need. I mean, the European Union has all, you know, when, when, when they first announced, you know, we need European civil code, I, mean, I come from a country where we don't have such a thing. I see, the market needs this, you know, this, this cuts this endless mantra. I don't think so. The market works pretty well without it because businesses work around, they create their own rules, and in some sense, a codification is just in their way. It's one more thing you have to work around, right? And so if there were a practical need that is driven by business interests, it would happen, probably. Mm -hmm. But there doesn't seem to be one. I want to add something. That, uh, starting from what uh, the, the stress France uh, put on culture, I, I agree with, uh, with, with what you say, France, and I agree with, with the, also with the refinement that Matthias brought to your... Uh, thought. But let's not forget that one of the reasons for which uh, the, the projects about uh, normative projects fail are on the scientific side, uh, as I said, this search for a compromise that at the end of, uh, between civil and common law that at the end of the way, uh, at the end of the day, uh, made unhappy everybody. And on the political side, the pressure of the professional bodies, who, which were against losing control over their own laws, over their own business. So this leads me to, uh, to, 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 to say that culture, the, the, the invocation of culture, which exists out there and everywhere, is also a reservoir of money for uh, the professional, domestic professional bodies. Because there's a clear divide in the legal professions uh, uh, in Europe, not only in Europe. There are the lawyers who at attend only to domestic affairs and who survive one way or another, sometimes very well because they're very good in succession, in family, in domestic contract law. And then there is the elite of international law firms 
which deal with the differences in the different legal regimes, different jurisdictions, and they help business to uh, wave through the uh, legal differences. So, and this is the refinement come to, to what Matthias said. Uh, I think most of market actors could be very much interested in uh, having uh, an even playing field. But they are certainly slow down in their, and certainly uh, downsized in their impact on the public debate by the fact that professional bodies, that lawyers, are by default against. Yeah, but why? Because they, they lose money otherwise. Yeah, of course, and the, how is that not legitimate? I mean, it took the Swiss 150 years, as of the moment they started to act as a country, to unify their laws of civil procedure. Why? Because if you unify the law, you pretend to, you will have the big shot lawyers coming from Zurich and litigating in Appenzell. That is not funny. We don't want the fucking, uh, sorry, the Zurich, the Zurich lawyers come to Appenzell. We want to avoid that at all costs. And so we pretend, of course, that we have a cultural difference that actually translates into dollars or Swiss yeah, francs. That's, that, that, that's my point. So, I mean, it might be, might be, might be good if you, it depends from the overall political vision, because if at the beginning and all the, the other projects were about creating a European market that becomes stronger and bigger and can compete with the Americans and the Chinese and all that kind of crap, you know, and that's, a, that's a, that was the, politic, the overall political vision of Europe was that. Yeah. And so what really failed was that political process, project, because we didn't succeed. are in full agreement. All I'm trying to say is that now that the political background has really changed, we can liberate ourselves from the inquiry that we were focusing on in the very beginning. I mean, we can explore, and we are not accountable to anyone. So from an analytical perspective, we can move into a openly critical perspective and inquiry. And uh, I love the idea of becoming more sociological. I agree with you that this was all in the pipeline in, in the beginning. I'm just trying to say, let's pay attention to this. Let's pay attention to what is not law, or that to what is not perceived as law by lawyers. Because the more we do it, the more interesting our inquiry will be. Uh, before leaving the floor to Antonio, I would just have a, 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 a more, a more thing to say. Uh, we are, we are 
paying tribute to uh, uh, a, a language, a lexicon that uh, we should get rid of. When you say we should pay more attention to sociology, as a matter of fact, you mean being more interested in how the law works in the reality. What are the facts that we have, uh, we have to face, we have to take into consideration, and how do we gather them, and, uh, and how, how we should gather more than that, etc., etc. This is precisely what any lawyer should always do, is the sort of, so, a, a strange taxonomy supported by the positivism of the legal professions and the, and the, the positivistic tradition on the continent that make us think and talk of this as if it were sociology. Gathering the facts, studying the facts, uh, having statistics, as we said the, this morning, is precisely what, what, what any scholar should do, any lawyer should do, right? It, it's not a sociology. Well, whatever the term. Antonio. Uh, I, I am in agreement with what uh, uh, Francis has said. Probably uh, all the project of uh, harmonization uh, of private law in Europe to return to a use commune has overlooked uh, the difficulties of difference of culture and difference in, in languages. <clears throat> but uh, may I go back to the origin of this project? Uh, this Common Core project uh, has been mentioned here. Uh, was based 55 years ago on the idea to promote knowledge, a better knowledge of uh, how the private law, but private law means general law. <laughs> the general law uh, works in Europe in order to find out if there was a common core or not. So uh, it was a scientific approach based on information, knowledge, understanding, critical appreciation of facts. Uh, the movement toward the European uh, Civil Law Code uh, was normative. Uh, so uh, it was on the wave uh, of uh, uh, a mainstream attitude uh, of the jurist uh, 25 years ago to promote uh, legal reforms. In, indeed, uh, uh, unified uh, the law in Europe, the private law in Europe, the contract law in Europe uh, is exactly as to propose a big legal reform to everyone. Uh, to promote a legal reform means to suggest what is the best solution for a very single topic. For instance, uh, uh, transfer to property, what is the best solution, um, thoughts, uh, uh, what is the best solution, the fourth system and not fourth system, what is the best solution, you have to find out what is the best solution. And that has been done, uh, for instance, uh, not only with the Ole Lando uh, project, uh, but uh, also with Von Bar uh, group, etc. Uh, there is a lack of, not of related cultural language, but of knowledge. Because uh, when you propose the best solution, the reaction of the legislator is, okay, good, fine, professor, fantastic. But uh, what happened in the society when your best solution is adopted by me? <clears throat> uh, a short remark. Uh, European legislation, if uh, I remember well, must be uh, coherent with and uh, the legislature must uh, adopt a um, impact assessment. Every big European legislation must be with an impact assessment in which the legislator said, okay, I imagine that the result that we can reach with this legislation is this, this, and this, the benefit, this, the cost can be this. Have you never ever looked to this impact assessment? Are the most empty <laughs> page that you can imagine. And this is evidence that nobody is uh, really prepared to release an impact assessment just because we don't know how the legal process works. Uh, the problem is a lack of knowledge and a lack of information. 
uh, we can propose a legal reform without an impact assessment, but we are not able to prepare any impact assessment. And uh, this uh, is a lacuna in our knowledge of the law that probably go by far behind the, the possibility of our goal. But we can contribute. So, if there are no other questions or interventions, and thanks to Luisa for having triggered the debate that was uh, uh, underneath the, the skin of this uh, session. Uh, so the time's come to for thank, thank for the thanks. Uh, first of all, thank you all for being here uh, and contributing to celebrate the 25th anniversary of a project. It, whenever I say it, I, I, I get stricken because it's really something 25 years for a project. So, part of century, right? Uh, and uh, and thank you to all the speakers today, speaker, yesterday speakers, uh, for uh, helping us to 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 move on this project. Thanks to the organi organizers. Thanks, thanks to Luis Antonioli. Uh, who, um, I very recently found out that if. She is vice dean of this uh, faculty. No, I mean, but I didn't know that. So I thank you personally and as a, as a vice dean, uh, along with uh, Fulvio Cortese, who is the dean, uh, for hosting us. I have to say that uh, we already have um, uh, an engagement with the Stockholm for the Common Core meeting of 2021. We are still on. We still don't know where, where uh, the Common Core meeting will take place in 2020. I, I'm just stressing that the love and the emotion that most people had in, uh, in coming back here to Trento make me hope that the faculty could consider for the 2020 again to host uh, uh, the meeting. We will see, we, you will tell us, but I want to stress that I collected many, many, I mean, uh, manifestation of enthusiasm and uh, of emotion for being back here. So uh, now there's a light lunch. I'm very surprised that Hugo has nothing to add. Very surprised. Maybe he's getting older. No one, no one's getting younger. That's true. But okay. So let's have lunch. Thank you. Thank you very, very much.